when building out artificial intelligence integrated software, a very, very important skill to have is the ability to know how to set up the prompts. Right now, the education around prompt engineering and the ability to access AI through API for our softwares is limited. So that is why I'm making today's video as I wanna show you how to actually create your prompts when using it through software. Here's something to keep in mind, y'all. The way we structure our prompts when it comes to accessing it through API in the software we create is entirely different than how we will create our prompts for ChatGPT in the front end or alternatively accessing ChatGPT through automation softwares like Zapier and Make. So in this video, we're gonna learn how to actually prompt engineer for API. Welcome back y'all. In today's video, I got this idea from one of the replies I got on a recent post that I did on Twitter or X, basically saying, how do you make changes to your prompts? Do you need to redeploy your app every time? So I'm actually gonna go, go ahead and show you my workflow on how I create AI prompts for the software I'm currently creating. If you don't know what that is, as of now, it's called TubeStamp. We plan on changing that name. So you may not, you may see a different name in my Twitter profile by the time you see this, who knows? I've been at this for the last seven months and I've been using prompts for the last year and a half. So you're gonna get all of that data compressed into this nice little short video. So you understand how we can start creating these prompts in our software. Understanding how to create AI prompts in software is basically anytime you hear an article talking about prompt engineer gets paid XYZ, big skill, monetized prompt engineering. This is where the money's at. Creating prompts in software is the most valuable skill asset you can have in the next coming years due to the new market we're about to emerge. I can almost guarantee you that in the future, I will be paid and other people will be paid just for the service of creating prompts in software because it's absolutely important to understand how to do it. So let's go ahead and learn how to do it. So the way I approach this is two major ways. First way is we're gonna go ahead and leverage Playground within OpenAI's dashboard here. We're gonna go ahead and select chat. Chat's gonna allow us to get relatively similar outputs that we would expect to see in our software. So we're gonna go ahead and first uh, adjust some of these settings on the right. So you can get context of how a prompt would look like in software when we're coding it. It could possibly look like this. Now we are transitioning a lot of the backend as of now to Python. This is more of a Node.js type of function here. We do a couple of things. First thing is we pass data through to our prompt. Now in this context, the prompt is gonna be the content. This is how we're referencing data. And then this is how we're referencing the open AI key in the headers of this logic. Now, the reason that some of y'all that use this API is like, why did you structure it like this? The reason I structured it like this and not traditionally with the completions call in a different format for Node.js was because of the fact that I needed to get the X rate limit header, which is basically how many tokens are available per minute. As of now, we're switching to Python. We're using uh, the other logic of exponential back off. So it's a lot better. Let's go in and learn different variables we'll use in our prompts. So the first one's gonna be max tokens and temperature. Those are gonna be the two major ones we're gonna use in our prompts right away. Max tokens, you're looking to set this around 500 to 1,000, depending on your use case. I think these are safe numbers. If you need to do more, do more. This is basically telling GBT how many words it's allowed to output. And this can basically vary on how big the output is for your underlying message. Next is temperature. This, my friends, is probably one of the most important things in prompt engineering. And if you are a company yourself and you wanna gut check an engineer that could possibly be working in your backend, this is how you gut check them. Basically, you're gonna ask something along the lines of other than max tokens, what other additional variable do you set in order to ensure scalable outputs? E.g., if this runs a thousand times, every single time it goes out, the output is consistent. That's actually the name of the game when it comes to prompting for AI in software, as user one and user 1000 should have the exact, if not the exact output to an extent in structuring and formatting. Knowing that, we have two different ways of structuring this, either through temperature or top P. Those are the two main variables. Personally, I like using temperature. Temperature, if I can go ahead and find the reference to it. Here we go. So temperature is basically what sampling temperature to use between zero and two, higher values like 0.8 will make the output more random and lower values will make it more focused and deterministic. If we're dealing with software and we're dealing with thousands of users, we gotta make it deterministic. We gotta make sure that every single output is similar so that some uh, like, you know, user 967 doesn't get like a crazy output because our temperature is too high. So I like to lower this low. We're going all the way down to 0.1. We set up parameters. We understand that we're doing 0.1. We'll do maximum length or tokens in this context. We'll go up to 500. In today's video, I'm gonna do a real quick example of how we could possibly structure this. 
the, vi the example for today is going to be assuming we're using, uh, we're receiving an email and in that email, I'm gonna just do like a simple prompt and show you kind of structuring of how we structure the prompts for an output that basically responds to that email. If I was doing this in code, basically I would probably put in subject line, we'll do subject. Then we would do comma body, comma open AI key. And then this would be, and then put the subject here, put the body here. This is how we'd reference it in the prompt. But because we're using the playground, all we care about, we don't need all this extra information. We can delete this and basically just start messing with the prompt itself. Let's go ahead and begin. So to show you an example prompt, I'm actually gonna show you the one we use in our software. Nah, I'm just joking. That's too, that's too valuable. Come on, y'all. You really think I was gonna do that? Come on, y'all. All right, so this one, basically this is how you wanna do it. We're gonna start with a please. I'm gonna go and shift enter your guidelines to formatting. And then we'll do semicolon here, shift enter, enter. And we'll put email subject, semicolon. And then we'll do email body. I like typically having the data, like the big piece of data that's being internalized at the end of a prompt. As you saw before, if this was the code logic, we'd make sure we add our data points like that but because we're not using code logic right now. I'm gonna put in fixed variables here just because I'm purely doing it for testing reasons, right? I'm just seeing if we had this data come through this prompt, how would it look? So I'm gonna input this fake data. The data we're playing with here is gonna be a fake partnership email. So we got this one, we got the subject line, got the dear James, everything of this nature. Now you, the question you might be having is like, okay, well, like how do we parse the data so it comes in like this? This is gonna be other logic within your software that basically uses either JSON or something of that nature where it parses the subject line of the data point that's received through the API call, gets the body. That's basically, we're dealing with the prompt now. We're assuming that the data is coming, the data that is coming into the prompt is as clean as possible. Remove any special characters, remove any extraneous stuff that isn't necessary. This is a data game, y'all. The less data we put in our prompt, the better it will perform and also the cheaper it will be form. To give context, if we're gonna go between GPT-4 Turbo to accomplish a job, compared to the GPT-3.5, we are talking about very, very large margins. A very specific detail from our current software is that if we had the same value point output through GPT-4, it's gonna cost us around 27 cents. That same logic, if we did it through 3.5, would only cost us around four cents. So we're talking hundreds of percents depending on the model you choose. So in this video, we're gonna go with GBT4 Turbo Preview. We're actually GBT40125. And as a side note real quick, you might be saying, what the heck do these numbers stand for? 0125, January 25th, 0613, June 13th, 0301, March 1st. This is 2023, of course. Knowing this, you're always gonna to wanna to go with probably the most recent endpoint model because even if, your prompt performs better than let's say GBT 613. These are deprecated endpoints. These are deprecated ways the model interacts with data. Therefore, even if your prompts actually perform better with older versions of the model, you're gonna have to just update your prompt. It's part of the game. So you're gonna have to go to GBT4 Turbo or GBT40125 to stay up to date with the new endpoints as these models are constantly improving. From my experience up to this point of seven months of development, I have noticed that even with these new endpoints, it isn't like, holy smokes, I got to completely change my prompt. It's slight tweaks. And on top of that, I have noticed that the outputs that I'm requesting actually are higher quality. So overall, it's a good thing. It's a good thing that's improving. And it's also a great caveat that basically, as these models improve, so do your software. Perfect. All right, so we're going to go ahead and start with the output we're looking for. We're going to say, please generate a response to this email. And we're gonna go ahead and just do this. And then guidelines of formatting here is what I like to do. This is where we're gonna basically ensure consistent outputs. So how do we want this data to look when we receive it? So to do so, we're gonna go ahead and start with length. Max of four sentences. Then we're gonna go ahead and say tone, professional. Now these can get compl complex. You can do whole sentences here, but this is like a really good way to organize your prompts at least with API. Tone, we'll say aim, awareness, reference the person's name who is reaching out if it's in the email body. Notice how I'm referencing data that's inputted through the actual name. So this is kind of like email body, email body, obviously in the actual code, it would be these brackets, right? But this is important. It's not straight up coding, of course, because we're still using layman dictation, but we are referencing 
you know, future things or future data points that's within the prompt with the actual name itself. So email body, email body. This is important. This, is, this ensures consistency. So let's go ahead and see what we get with this output so far uh, from the guidelines I formatted here. Please generate email response when hit submit. So here we go. We got subject, evaluate your event with Bark and Bite. Let's partner. Dear Sam, thank you for reaching out and considering a partnership with Receiving a Company event. I am intrigued by the opportunity. And notice how it does grab Sam here. We try the opportunity with Bark and Bite to create an engaging and memorable experience for our dog loving attendees. Best regards, James. Notice how there's a couple things in here I don't want. I don't want a subject line. I don't want this recipient, like this like variable that isn't really put. So we're just gonna go ahead and update this. And what's important for you to understand is when we update this, I need to exit this out. Think of this like if you're familiar with my Zapier tutorials, refreshing the memory key as if I hit submit again, it would have used that previous output as context and basically just mess up the whole process. Side note, I also noticed in that tweet, it said, do you redeploy every single time you do logic when these AI prompts and it changes. I'll first put it through the ringer in playground. Once I get satisfied and confident that I really like what it's doing, like 90%, then I'll put it into my function. Then I'll redeploy in a staging environment, of course, and see what I can do in that realm. That right there, you'll notice a plus or minus 10% difference on the output. Why that incurs between playground and the actual software calling it within that logic, I have no clue. That's why you have to make sure that you are very specific in these prompts and get them as specific as possible. Okay, so we're gonna add another dash here. We're gonna say no subject line in output. We're gonna add another dash here. We're gonna say use no variables in output. Perfect. Let's go ahead and minus that. Hit submit here and see what it comes up with. There we go, y'all. We got Dear Sam, no subject line, paragraph, best regards, James. And at scale, we can expect no subject lines, we can expect no variables in the output and proceed in this manner. And the reason I'm so confident in that is because of the fact that as you see over there, we set our temperature to 0.1, which basically tells the API, hey, don't mess around, don't get creative on me. This isn't Funhouse. You're not supposed to be drawn with crayons. Be consistent. If you liked today's video, make sure to leave a like, it's completely free. Subscribe if you haven't already, as basically this is probably the most modern up-to-date information when it comes to actually creating AI software. And lastly, because I know I've been asked this a lot and I see your comments and I try to respond. Yes, in the future, I will be creating a fully in-depth how to create an AI software from zero lines of code to let's say 20,000 lines of code, whatever it may be, and actually show the code and actually show the logic. But to be completely transparent with y'all, because that's part of the name of the game of this channel, I'm not doing it yet. And I'm not doing it yet for two major reasons. First major reason is like, I'm in the process of creating my own software and that's pretty heavy on my day. And basically I want to get the full life cycle of that software, not in the sense of like three years from now, but in the sense of like, Hey, this is what happened from day dot to day 1000 users. So when I build out this playlist, you'll get all that knowledge put into it and you'll be like, okay, well, at least I can watch this guy and realize that like, he really did go from date like zero lines of code to a thousand active monthly subscribed users. And that'd be a really, really beneficial video or playlist. The second major reason of why I'm not doing it yet is because it's pretty niche. This would probably niche me down too much at the point of where I'm at in content creation. This is kind of like a business decision where I'm sitting at 30,000 subscribers. If I went down the rabbit hole and did do this entire playlist of coding, this would basically cause a lot of the subscribers on my channel to be like, yo, this is too much y'all I'm leaving. So that's why as of now, but trust me, it's coming. I want to do it because I think it'd be a ton of fun. Plus no one in this space has actually done a playlist like that. That's actual value. It's all just heebie GB. Oh yeah. Create a SAS no code tool. Now, if you know why that's a bad idea, you can check out that video, but I'll see you in the next video. That playlist right there goes over from concept to software. You're gonna learn a bunch of stuff when it comes to creating software, such as understanding how to access API at scale, software ideas, if you want some ideas, that's a random video. That's my face. I'll see you in the next video.